Let us read God's word in 1 John, some verses from chapter 3 and from chapter 5 of 1 John. 1 John 3, verses 9 through 18, first of all. Looking out for the references to regeneration, or being born or begotten of God. Whosoever is born of God, 1 John 3, verse 9 says, doth not commit sin, that is, habitually, without repentance, willy-nilly, for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin in the sense i just explained because he is born of god in this the children of god are manifest and the children of the devil whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of god neither he that loveth not his brother for this is the message that ye heard from the beginning that we should love one another not as cain who was of that wicked one and slew his brother and wherefore slew he him because his own works were evil and his brothers righteous marvel not my brethren if the world hate you we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren he that loveth not his brother abideth in death whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Now chapter 5, first of all, verses 1 through 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Then 18 through 21, the last four verses of this chapter and book. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. And that wicked one, the devil, toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come. And hath given us an understanding that we might know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Let's read together James 1, verse 27, our text. James 1 verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Beloved, the last two verses in James 1, the subject of this series of sermons, form a pair of First of all, verse 26 deals with the negative. Vain religion. If any man among you seems <coughs> to himself to be religious and bridleth not his tongue but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. 
which is the sort of religion we don't want. And then second, verse 27, our text, deals with pure religion, not vain religion, pure religion. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And that's the sort of religion we do want and by God's grace we're practicing and that's our calling. Now religion in our text is obviously, you didn't believe this but I want to make it really clear, it's obviously not saying that these are the things that one does in order to earn one's salvation. You know, if you go and start visiting the sick and so forth and widows and afflicted, keep yourself and spot from the world, you'll heap up a pile of merit and God will let you into heaven. Salvation, in that sense, that's, that's achieved by the work of Jesus Christ atoning for all of our sins, obtaining for us the righteousness of God which com becomes ours through faith, in which faith is wrought in us when God regenerates us. James 1 verse 27, when it says what pure religion is, is referring to the fruits in the life of those whom God has already saved. It's talking about the service of Jehovah's covenant friends. James 1 verse 27 describes the faithful religious service of God's people as pure and undefiled. Those two adjectives. And the two Greek words mean respectively clean and pure and the other word, undefiled and unsoiled. So positively, clean and pure. Negatively, not defiled, not spoiled. The idea is that true religion is genuine, sincere, and so acceptable and pleasing to God. I want to go back to the basic idea of the Greek words, such a religion is not dirty or unclean or defiled or soiled. It's clean and pure, well washed in the eyes of God. And you understand, of course, that in this life, the believer himself is never without sin. And obviously, therefore, too, his or her best works are never sinless either. But our text is teaching us positively that Jehovah in heaven views godly, sincere service to him out of faith, the things we're going to deal with later, as clean in his eyes, as acceptable and pleasing, and all the sin in it, text doesn't mention this but the rest of scripture means we need to consider this briefly too all the sin and the good works God forgives and washes away for the sake of Jesus Christ his son and our Lord now the instances given in our text of pure undefiled religion are striking James could have said many things about pure and genuine religion he could have said, for instance, it's bringing forth the fruit of the Spirit. That's the way Paul presents it, in effect, in Galatians <coughs> chapter 5. He could have said, pure religion is presenting your body as a living sacrifice and renewing your mind so that you are transformed. And I hope that when I said that, some of you were thinking, yeah, that's Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I remember the sermons, the text. James could have said what Peter, in, in fact, did say in 1 Peter 1. Be ye holy, for I am holy. 
And surely being holy is pure religion. He could have used the language and presented the ideas of 1 John 1 verse 7. Pure religion is walking in the light as God is in the light and therefore having fellowship with one another with the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us from all sin. But James 1 verse 27 says this, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And before we consider those two things, I want to say something about the two of them in general. They are obviously not you didn't think this either, but I want clarity in our minds. They're obviously not all the duties required of us. So that if you just visit the widows and orphans and keep yourself on spot from the world, you fulfill all your obligations to God. It's not intended to be exhaustive. The idea of these two things is that they are especially good markers Distinguishing characteristics of true or genuine service of God, what James calls pure and undefiled religion, as we shall see. And I want you to bear in mind too, beloved, the context of James 1, and especially the reference to regeneration in James 1 verse 18, and what this has to say about our text. I'll give you a hint. It's like what it had to say about verse 26 last week. And we'll return to that at the end of the sermon. For now, our theme is pure religion. One, visiting the fatherless and widows. Two, keeping unspotted from the world. And three, what I hinted at earlier, Manifesting the life of regeneration. Pure religion is the three verbs. Visiting the fatherless and widows. Keeping unspotted from the world. Which two things are manifesting the life of regeneration. What then is involved in visiting the fatherless who are of course Orphans, at least with respect to their dad, little boys and girls, or even older ones, who have lost their fathers. And widows, they are women whose husbands have died. You understand that if someone's fatherless, they've lost their, their dad, and if someone's a widow, they've lost their husband, and if the father in a family dies first, then his death makes his wife a widow and his children fatherless. And especially in the time when this was written, the husband and the father was the breadwinner so that when he is gone, the children and their mother are destitute. Visiting such people obviously entails meeting up with them and that ordinarily takes place at the home though of course other places are possible too speaking now of explicitly christian activities this may involve praying with them in their affliction reading the scriptures with them encouraging and comforting the widows and the fatherless in their very difficult situation. Going further, help is involved here, maybe doing messages for them or doing work for them, especially the work that the husband and father used to do, but other things as well, and then relieving them of some of their difficulties you can make them a meal. You can give them things that they need. 
and assist them financially. Now James, James served in the church in Jerusalem. James was there when the first diaconate was voted in and installed in Acts chapter 6. So he knows all about that church office. But what he's saying is that the duties of Christians are not exhausted by the office of deacon. So that even in a church, even if you're in the same church and that person's in the same church and your church has deacons, this doesn't mean, well, I don't have to do anything of that sort. We just let the, deacon, the deacons do their work and your work isn't to excuse them from doing their work either, but that the individual can help in various ways alongside <coughs> the deacon and even sometimes completely apart from the deacon with the deacon not knowing or even needing to know what help you have provided. I mentioned Acts chapter 6, verse 1 says that the office of the deacon was created in God's providence and will in connection with widows in Jerusalem. The first deacons, there were seven of them, were created in the church at Jerusalem where James was, as I said. So James is well familiar with this idea, especially as pertaining now to widows. And then James says in chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, If a brother or sister be naked, short of clothes is meant here, and destitute of daily food, and James could hardly have written that without thinking of the events in Acts chapter 6, And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? And the context, as you may well know here, is a faith without works. And then a faith that doesn't work shows that it's not really a faith at all. It's just an idle notion. The person doesn't really believe in Jesus Christ for salvation, isn't converted at all. So now James, in Jerusalem, caring for widows, is writing to the diaspora, the scattered believers, many if not all of them were, were being Jews, apart from Jerusalem and away from that place and throughout the Greco-Roman world, making essentially the same point. Pure religion is to visit the fatherless and widows, and not just the widow whose husband left her millions, she probably gets all sorts of visits, including from a few suitors and men who like her hand. But the widows and orphans in their affliction. And affliction includes more than the sort of difficulties I mentioned earlier. Affliction would include the fact that the widow and orphan, especially in that day, was particularly vulnerable and liable to be oppressed because there was no man about the house and so visiting the fatherless and widows in their affliction means giving them some advice and protection and maybe even some legal assistance so that they aren't taken advantage of or abused. And one form which the scriptures speak of regarding the abuse of widows involves even the church or to be more accurate the false church or wicked people even in a true church. I'm thinking of Jesus' words in Matthew 23 verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. So here you have some widow. In come the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, or some money-grubbing church cleric, and they make these long prayers to this woman in distress trying to impress her and then try and grub a little bit of money out of her and said you know Harry's dead and Harry would have wanted you to have given some money to the church 
And the minister's thinking he can get a nice holiday out of this if he plays his cards right. And that's the sort of chicanery that these scribes and Pharisees were up to, devouring widows' houses and getting money for the church when the money was actually needed not for the church, and it shouldn't have been going to the church, but to the poor widow who is left destitute. Now this word that's rendered visit, as in visiting the fatherless and the widow in James 1 verse 27, includes in itself the language of looking after, overseeing and caring for. And therefore the principle applies to all who have more than the usual sets of needs. It would include widowers, in some cases a widower is even more need of help than, than a widow, perhaps even more in our society, and the poor man can't do a big pie for himself. He was spoiled all those years. It would, it would apply too to those who are very old and frail and so need extra assistance, to those who are disabled, whatever their age may be, to women who are abused, And here Jesus' words in the parable of the sheep and the goats come in. I was sick and ye visited me. I was in prison and ye came to me. And if the children wonder what are God's people doing in prison, well some of God's people end up in prison for Christ's sake. Guido de Bray ended up in jail. Not because he was a criminal, but because he confessed the truth. Likewise, John the Baptist. Sometimes the people of God <coughs> end up in prison because of a miscarriage of justice. And there are some unbelievers too who end up behind bars for the same reason. The system isn't perfect, even granted the best will in the world. Sometimes the people of God find themselves in prison because of a crime they committed before they were converted to Christ. Or maybe only they are saved when they are in prison. And sometimes believers can end up in jail because of a sin that they committed when deeply backslidden. But for whatever reason, the people in prison who belong to Jesus are to be visited too. Now all of this raises the question, why is it that visiting the fatherless and widows, and I applied that to a few other similar cases, but now let's come back to the ones that are specifically mentioned, visiting the fatherless and widows is especially spoken of as constituting pure and undefiled religion. Well, one answer is, that this is a biblical calling to care for the fatherless and widows, a biblical calling for the people of God. In the book of the covenant, in Exodus 22, verse 22, it is, was forbidden the Old Testament saints, and by extension, New Testament believers, to mistreat widows and orphans. Here is Deuteronomy 14, verse 29. The Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied at your house and with your food, especially now with these tithes, etc., they may eat and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. Here is the godly example of Job in chapter 29. These moving words, Job protesting his innocence that he had been struck with this awful plague and misery not because of some great sin, explains, when the ear heard me, then it blessed me. When the eye saw me, 
it gave witness to me, because I delivered the poor that cry, and the fatherless, and him that had none to help him. The blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing with joy. We could also point to Psalm 68, verse 5, which we sang earlier. Because the Lord a Father is unto the fatherless, God is the widow's judge or vindicator within his place of holiness. So we could say that visiting the fatherless and the widow is imitating God. So it's commanded. And it's the imitation of God. But there are many Christian activities that are commanded by God and that reflect His glory. So the question needs to be sharpened. Why is visiting orphans and widows presented as a clear mark of pure and undefiled religion? I want to make some answers to that starting off with this thought that visiting the fatherless and widows though in church sounds like a very good thing and everyone's saying yeah that's the way to go that's that's right that warms my heart but visiting such people and especially now in their affliction is not glamorous and isn't going to get you any public acclaim that is, when you're doing it in a Christian fashion, when you're with your left hand not knowing what your right hand is doing. It may even be said, and this is not intended to discourage anyone who may conceive of themselves as being in the category or near it, it may well not be particularly pleasant. Because it is very well possible, and especially when James wrote these words in the first instance, that visiting the fatherless and the afflicted may not take you into the very nicest part of town and the house where this poor family lives I mean it may have lost a large section of its furniture with the death of the father and husband and then when you're coming to people who are poor and who've lost their father and husband and when a text says in their affliction you're coming into a home where the people are in great distress and misery. And you might be thinking to yourself, boy, that's all I need. I'm not particularly good for myself and to go to a place like that today. I don't know if I can cope with that. Enough problems for myself. Visiting such people may also, and this is probably part of what James is thinking about too, it may also cost you materially money or money in buying possessions for them and it is highly unlikely if these are orphans and or at least fatherless or widows that these are people who are never going to be able to repay you financially so it's it's a gift visiting them of course and everybody feels this visiting them just like anybody else, involves losing some time and maybe taking you out of your way, or perhaps even worse, taking you out of your comfort zone. <gasps> Imagine, we couldn't do that, could we? And then, you may have to prepare yourself beforehand, thinking about them and their difficulties, considering what way I can help or encourage them. Sometimes you think, you know, I don't really think there's much way I can. I don't have many of the skills that would help these people. And you have to choose what scripture you're going to read, if that's going to be part of your visit. Well, it doesn't always have to be, and sometimes it's not really appropriate. Maybe what they want is just friendship at that time. And maybe you're going to have to think, too, what am I going to read and what am I going to say? And, and that, of course, makes us nervous. In short, then... Even explaining these things fairly briefly, visiting the fatherless and widows in their distress is obviously Christian love, love of the neighbour, 
It's what older people, or rather people in an earlier age, used to call disinterested love, which means not that you're not interested in the person, but means you're doing it selflessly. You don't have a personal stake. You're not going to gain something from this. Although, of course, you may gain an awful, awful lot spiritually. And if that destitute person is trusting from the Lord, they may well be a massive encouragement to you more than you even to them. Disinterested Christian love that is costly. Time, money, your own earthly needs and comfort. And so James 1 verse 27 says, Pure religion and undefiled is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. And then James mentions a second distinguishing mark that not only helps us identify pure religion, but fills out the picture significantly. It is to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now you know that the word world can mean various things in scripture. I'm just going to mention two. It can refer to the brute creation. Trees and birds and clouds and soil and all sorts of things. And the brute creation is good and is to be used by the believer with thanksgiving, 1 Timothy 4 says. And then that neutral sense, the stuff sense of the world, then there's also the world referring to the ungodly worldviews and lifestyles of those who are outside of Jesus Christ. And here you have the brute creation pressed into the service of sin and not into the service of the Creator. So this refers, this negative, negative spiritual, moral sense of the word world, refers to the whole system of thought and speech and behavior that proceeds from totally depraved men, and which is the general thinking of unbelievers out there and which can never leave us utterly untouched. James uses the word world in this sense, not only in our text, but in James 4 verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world, and he's not just saying liking little birds that come to your bird feeder, the friendship of the world means friendship with people in the world who are ungodly so that you follow and become like them. The friendship of the world is enmity or hatred of God. Whosoever therefore wants to be the friend of the world, in this sense, is the enemy of God. In 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17 exhorts us, love not the world, which doesn't mean that you can't enjoy a nice walk by the coast. It means love not that ungodly system of thought designed by the unbeliever to suit themselves. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world, I like this bit, passeth away. Good, good job and good riddance. And the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God, on the other hand, abideth forever. Now James 1 verse 27 presupposes two things when it talks about the world. It presupposes that the believer is clean, being washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And it presupposes that the world is morally and spiritually dirty and filthy. It presents to us a picture along these lines. Here's the child of God, 
He's had a shower or a bath, whichever you prefer. And he's wearing beautiful, clean, white garments given him in Jesus Christ. And there he is. He's in the world, that is, on a wet, mucky path. And the believer, in living in this world physically, and among the world, the ungodly people, in his daily walk, wearing these clothes, <coughs> being washed, going down that pathway, has to be very careful. Otherwise, he's going to get all sorts of spots of mud on his trousers or dress, and maybe even elsewhere on his skin, and he's going to get plastered, as we say, or very dirty. He's going to have to be careful how he walks. And you've all had that, walking along a mucky pathway in the winter. And you look out for the puddles and the mucky bits, and yeah, you know what that's like. This is, in short, the image of the Christian life in the ungodly world presented in the text. And this is how we must think of the way in which we are to live here below. And the young people too, as well as the old people, must realize that this is their calling before God. You get some who are naive and they think, well, you know, the ungodly world, it's basically a good, or at least they're not that bad, and there's certain people aren't really that bad. And actually there's a whole lot of people out there in the world and they're nicer than some of the people in the church. And they're especially a lot nicer than certain people I could point at in the church. And I would far rather be friends of them and spend time in their company than with other people who worship with me on Sunday. And I actually think that they, the ungodly ones, are better and nicer and kinder. And so you could even get what James 4 verse 4 is saying. You're an adulterer or an adulteress. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity against God? If you want to be a friend of the world, you are an enemy of God. And it's hard enough for the Christian to keep himself unspotted from the world, but if he wants to be friends with the world, then he is already filthy, polluted in his mind, and in his heart, and in his soul, and then he needs to repent and get back to his first love. He isn't trying to be careful living in the world. He's wallowing like a pig in the mud. And he wants more of it. Now sometimes scripture explains that the world is out to squeeze us into its mold. In the text before us, the goal of the world is to pollute us with its own filth. To get us to adopt or even embrace its attitudes and views and maxims and goals and therefore its behavior and speech so that we become dirty morally and spiritually like them. There's a horrible thing and you even see it, these initials, O-M-G. And the unbeliever, he can't say anything something strange happens, it's this, oh my, and that's just horrible. You're just treating the word of God like dirt. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Your own filthy mind should be stopped. And we don't want our children picking up on nonsense like that either. And we contract filth whenever the world's rebellious attitudes and words become ours. And whenever the world's corruption of marriage and the family enter our own homes so that the behavior of husbands becomes unloving and callous and wives become insubordinate and bossy and children become disobedient, lazy, stroppy and answering back, then we should understand that what we're doing is becoming dirty before God, like the world. 
Our garments, and we ourselves, become defiled through picking up of the greed and covetousness of the world, its lies, its ubiquitous pornography. And we need to be very careful because the world has machines and activities and that, that are designed to splatter mud upon people. That's what goes on with the television. I'm not saying there aren't things that you can watch on the television. But most, if not, much, if not most of the stuff on there is just squirting you with mud coming out of that stupid screen. And you need to be very careful too as you maneuver around the internet because you can get dirty <coughs> there very quick. Or even as you listen to the radio, especially certain, certain channels, and what the world calls entertainment is, for the most part, spraying people with slurry, spiritually. That's what it is. And it's not just these means. The Christian struggles because even when he's at work, he has to avoid contracting filth. And even if he's out shopping, he has things all around him that you think this is the world. This is not approved of by God. And I mustn't be influenced by this. But all of this, beloved, is not to deny the crucial basic truth that our worst problem isn't actually the world, although it is a big problem. But God says, live with it by my grace. The worst problem is ourselves, not our world, ourselves, our own evil flesh. And the evil world, this is our problem, the evil world appeals to our own flesh, which is attracted to it. That's the worst thing. Why do I like this? Why do I want this? It's not just what they're doing out there. It's me. It's me. That's what the Christian says. And then he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? But he doesn't finish there. He actually answers his own question. I thank God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, with the mind, I serve the law of Christ, but with the body. And when we contract this filth, and it's practically inescapable, and even when you're walking down a mucky path, the best you can do sometimes is get a certain number of spots at the bottom of your trousers, and you throw it in the wash, you get out the clothes brush, because what can you do? It's impossible. To avoid all filth. Then spiritually you confess your sins before God with grief and hatred. You go to the cross asking for forgiveness and also strength to overcome. And you believe the promise that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness as we go to the fountain of sin for sin and uncleanness. That Zechariah speaks of in the cross of Jesus Christ. And now this question, why is keeping ourselves unspotted from the world a clear mark of genuine religion? Just like we asked for the first mark. One reason is that it's so very difficult. It's even impossible without the grace of God. And even with the grace of God that is given to us as totally depraved sinners, it's still very difficult because it involves keeping yourself unspotted from the world, self-denial, earnest prayer, the employment of Scripture to cleanse your heart and mind from all these worlds, <coughs> and the mortification of sin and our own lusts. It requires also 24-hour diligence not just during a church worship service or even a Sunday, but at all times, keep yourself unspotted from the world. It's all around, all the time. And the only way in which it can be done to whatever extent it is done is by the grace of God, out of love for the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ. And if visiting the fatherless and the widows in their affliction is keeping the second table, Love for the neighbor.
Keeping oneself unspotted from the world is only possible out of the love of God rather than the love of the world. And 1 John 2 contrasted those two things. Now we need to see this more briefly. Our text in the context of the second half of James 1. Pure religion and undefiled. The argument of James, and I'm making it clear to you, the argument of James is that pure religion and undefiled can only proceed from God's holy and incorruptible seed which is planted in us at regeneration. And that holy, incorruptible seed planted in us at regeneration is mentioned in 1 Peter 1 verse 23 and 1 John 3 verse 9. The seed implanted in us and the pure, undefiled religion, one leads to the other. The other can only come out of that pure, holy seed. And what James 1.27 says is this, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is such and such. Why did he mention Father? How is God our Father? Regeneration. James 1 verse 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Your Father is the one who begot you. That's how he is your Father. And our holy life in its entirety proceeds from our regeneration and the continual infusion into us of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Of God's own will begat he us with the word of truth so that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That's the result of regeneration. A kind of first fruits. And the first fruits were the first fruits of the crop that were brought to the tabernacle, the temple, and especially dedicated to him. So regeneration means that we're sort of first fruits dedicated to God. And pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father who regenerated us is this. Here's us being first fruits dedicated to the Lord, visiting the fathers and widows in their affliction and keeping ourselves unspotted from the world. And James is teaching here of the result and calling of regeneration, that is the life which flows from being born again, fits perfectly with 1 John. They use different language, but it's the same teaching. And that's especially the parts of 1 John that we read earlier. Visiting the fatherless and the afflicted. That proceeds from being born again, James is arguing. Now look with me at 1 John. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, the believer, well, that's a person who's born again. Because you can't believe unless you're born again. And now this. Everyone that loves the God who begat him loves also him who is begotten of him. So here's a born again believer. Believes the God who gave him the new birth, loves him, and then loves the other people who are born again too. Chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth has been born of God and knows God. And now, getting even closer, 1 John 3, verses 17 and 18. Whoso hath this world's good, meaning here goods or possessions, whoever has the world's goods or possessions and sees his brother, someone born again like him, have need, and shuts up the bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. That is, give to help the needy person, because you've been born again, and that person's your brother. And if you say, well, what about keeping ourselves unspotted from the world? Well, 1 John says that comes alone from being born again too. 1 John 5 verse 4 whosoever is born of God overcomes the world 
the evil world system by not caving in, by resisting it, fighting against it. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith, which comes out of being born again. For who is he that overcomes the world, but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? A person believes in Jesus. Jesus' strength, the person that overcomes the world. Doesn't capitulate, doesn't apostatize, doesn't cave in, but presses on and overcomes it. And then chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, as I explained earlier, living in sin impenitently. Doesn't do that because he can't do that. But he that is begotten or born of God keeps himself by God's grace so that the wicked one, Satan, doesn't touch him. And we know that we are of God by regeneration, whereas the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we overcome it through the faith of Jesus. Here it is. This is the end of the sermon series. This is the end of the section in verses 18 through 27. The big picture. Regeneration. God plants the incorruptible seed in us. Sovereignly of his own will. And then through the preaching of the gospel, this implanted spiritual seed comes to manifestation. In faith and godly living. Then James tells us, and I'm working from James 1, 18 and following, James tells us that the same word which brought that regenerate life into manifestation comes to you in the preaching of the gospel. Receive it as such. And this means that before you hear it, come with alacrity, ready to hear. Saying, setting aside your sins. During the hearing it, listen closely, lay it up in your heart, and after the hearing of it, you're slow to speak against it so you don't get angry. And you are resolved by the grace of God to practice what you hear. Being doers of the word and not hearers only. Because if you're a hearer, you're like a man who looks in the mirror and then immediately forgets what sort of a person he is. Sinful, needing God's grace. And if you are only a hearer of the word, your religion is vain. And the same answering back to the word when preached will show itself in an unbridled tongue, saying whatever you want, evil, vicious things. But the doer of the word, he's the one who keeps looking into the pure law, perfect law of liberty, continues on it. Not a forgetful here, but a doer. This person is blessed in his or her deed. And this is this pure religion through being regenerated, through listening to the word, through doing the word. This, is, this pure new birth results in pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father, including the difficult self-denying calling of visiting the fatherless and the widows, even in their affliction, and keeping oneself unspotted from the world. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, bless to us this word, the word that originally regenerated us, so that we do it. And this pure religion is wrought more and more in our hearts and will and deeds. And grant us this rich grace through Jesus Christ, our glorious Lord, who cares and loves us. Amen.